Hello everyone, uh, this is Rich Rogers and I am the moderator for a panel you're about to enjoy. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Indie Plus, the first of our Pound Game Nights, where we uh, have a number of games that we are running, our tabletop role-playing games. And then this is one of the features, which is a panel where we get on some uh, indie or small press game designers and we talk to them. So this is a, a live hangout right now. If you're on the YouTube channel or if you're on Google+, Plus, uh, please feed us some questions that you have about designing the future or games for science fiction. And I think primarily our focus for this is the future. So we'll talk a little bit about modern science fiction, but I'm, I'm thinking that primarily we'll talk about the futuristic, designing the future being the, uh, the uh, overall focus here. So let me introduce our panelists, um, starting from uh, left to right as I see it. First we have uh, Tris, uh, Chris Tregenza from 66. Uh, he created the 66 RPG, which is a universal game system, and he's also currently editing 66 Bots, which is the first science fiction setting. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. Uh, good to chat to you, Rich. Hello, everyone. Thank you. The next is uh, Philomena Young, who is from Machine Age Productions. Uh, she is the creator of Flatpak, which is a very interesting game that was kickstarted successfully. She's also an active freelancer and just uh, got was one of the Fate Core uh, Kickstarter uh, goals that was slammed down in the huge Fate Kickstarter that's gone ongoing right now as we record this. She's also worked for White Wolf and a number of other uh, production companies. Nice to meet you, Philomena. Thank you for coming on. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Uh, on, next we have from Memento Mori Theatrics, uh, one of my personal favorite game designers uh, because he's created games like Lacuna Part 1 and also Inspectors. And uh, he also, with Luke Crane, created the Free Market game. He's also written for White Wolf and a, a bunch of other small projects that he's released uh, throughout his gaming history. This is Jared Sorensen. How are you doing, Jared? I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. He's always so verbose. <clears throat> and uh, last but not least, we have Ryan Macklin from the internet. Uh, he's the man of the future, actually. As a young computer programmer, he was drawn to the cyberpunk genre. And today he forges the future in victory as the Mage Ascension Technocracy developer. Nice to have you on, Ryan. You have to speak. Uh, uh, this is, wait, speaking, using my words, no, I'm a writer. <laughs> That's not true. I have podcast proof that you talk into a microphone. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, this is uh, potentially an explicit uh, YouTube and uh, Hangout. Um, we don't plan on going blue all the time, but we do have a couple people who may make that choice. So, uh, be warned. <clears throat> uh, so, what I did earlier this week is I crowdsourced for some, some questions about designing sci-fi games, and I, I want to start with the one that my wife asked uh, first, because she's my wife. Uh, her question was, what from science fiction, television, books, movies, what, what device from science fiction, or, or one of your games, what device is out there that doesn't currently exist that you would love to have right now? Philomena? Start right on me. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 sure. That's easy, right? The teleporter? Duh. Um, there are so many game conventions that I would like to be at right now um, that the best I can do is a hangout. Not that there's anything wrong with internet conventions, but, you know, I want to be there. Um, and flying with many, many children and, and all that sort of thing is just a nightmare. <clears throat> So hands down, teleporter. As long as it's everything worked. If it didn't work, then I wouldn't want to use it. Yeah, that the Star Trek <laughs> movie with the horrible trans. Yeah, that that was that was horrific. Yeah. Or space balls, right? When he ends up with his head on backwards. <laughs> anybody has seen Mel Brooks movies anymore? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they were good. They were good. Uh, so Jared Sorensen, what uh, device from the future would you want right now? Um, we can be explicit, right? This is. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's made that so. No, um, I'm gonna say iBrain. What's iBrain? Uh, it's 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 when Apple starts producing computers for your brain. To think for you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's ninety nine cents per thought, though. 
That's <laughs> that's cool. I I don't need that many. I would spend like a buck ninety eight a day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, neural uh, interface. Nice. Uh, what could go wrong? Well, nothing because I haven't seen H plus. Uh, Chris, what about you? What what from the future would you like? Um, I was going to go for the classic hoverboard, you know, because, you know, who doesn't want one? Um, but I have to say that, you know, I'm going to be, have to be practical here, and I want um, gene uh, regeneration therapy, you know. I, I want the immortality, you know. Either that or singularity. I, I'll go for either option at the moment, but, you know, I was, I was doing stuff with pensions the other day, and mortality suddenly become a lot higher up my list of priorities. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Well, Ryan Macklin, what, what would you like from the future delivered to your doorstep? Well, uh, given that uh, some my, my first and second answers were already done, I would like a time travel device so that I could answer first. <laughs> Bar, barring that, um, to give something new, uh, replicator technology would be awesome. Uh, who doesn't want some Earl Grey hot, right? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's the fluff of the of the uh, the start. Let's actually get into the meat of it now. <clears throat> uh, Jason Pitt asked a couple of interesting questions, and the first one, and I, I'm going to ask this question, and if you guys, uh, who, whoever's most interested in starting off, go ahead, and everybody else, be quiet if they went first. <laughs> what role do aliens have within the science fiction genre? That's a great question. <laughs> We're I, all thinking well, about it very hard. I would say that it has the role of basically reflecting a given human traits because there's nothing like juxtaposition and contrast to make you see something. Um, you know, like like I mean, we take all like the Star Trek stuff, like Klingons and their honor, and I want to stab you in the face with this completely impractical sword. Uh, well, then. You know, that, that ends up sort of highlighting, all right, well, let's look at the humans that are like that and let's look at how they're not like that and that, that sort of thing where it's just like, basically it hangs a lampshade on different elements of humanity. Yeah, I agree. I think mirroring the human condition is one of the aspects of aliens that are interesting. Is there anything else that in a science fiction game we can do with aliens uh, that, that make them important? I'm not a big fan of aliens. Um, in real life, I'm fine with them, but in, in science fiction, I think they're uh, kind of boring. Um, you don't really need aliens in a science fiction game, and having aliens in your or, or story and having aliens in your story or game doesn't make it sci-fi. Um, it just makes it about uh, people who are different than you, and you can tell that story with uh, people from other lands, other cultures, other languages, uh, without ever leaving Earth. Well, to be fair, that's pretty much every fantasy race is an alien, just in a fantasy context. Yeah, I mean, I hate fantasy too. So. <laughs> I, thought I thought I'd bring that up so you could say that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ryan. You're welcome, Internet. <laughs> what about you, Philomena? Um, any thoughts on on aliens and if they're important in a science fiction genre? Um, I like the first contact moment. I like the idea of seeing um, how a civilization handles, oh crap, everything we believed is wrong. Um, you know, hey, I guess maybe there's not a god, or however humans um, deal with the first contact event. Um, I dig on I dig on futuristic sci-fi for like the um, the social sciences as well as the like the hard sciences. So um, what Ryan kind of said, like you can really kind of examine our cultural bias and our behavior by putting something other and different. Um, but it's got to be really something other than and different. It's, it can't just be like um, people with, with pointy ears are elves and people who are with our pointy ears are Vulcans. Um, you almost have to like, my preference is for like a very biologically incompatible thing. Um, um, I don't know if you saw the Children of Earth series from um, blanking. Uh, um, Torchwood, right? Oh, um, yeah. yeah, and the aliens that they present in that, because there's a lot of aliens, but the, the problem aliens in that are so biologically different. 
and so ethically different and so culturally different that what's perfectly reasonable for them is so um, not possible for us, um, then what you get to do is you get to see humans fighting with each other to figure out how to deal with this conflict that is way beyond them and can't be handled in normal ways. Um, and then all of the drama is really internal. And so all of the drama becomes social science rather than, well, what is it made of? Um, I mean, if you're going to do aliens, that, that's how I would do it. Uh, Chris, are you uh, pro or con aliens in your games? Um, they're, they're very useful plot devices. I mean, they, yeah, they do obviously give you that sort of reflective um, statement about us sort of functioning the game. And, you know, the fact that you have an outside force which you don't have to explain. It's almost like having gods you can just drop down on the players. Um, but what, what interests me as a science fiction fan about aliens tends to be more about the ecosystem and the animals rather than the intelligent aliens. You know, because they, you know, they almost always are these reflections of humanity, um, apart from a few books which really make them truly alien. Uh, but the actual ecosystems, the, the ideas of completely different animals fill, filling the same niches and things like that, I find that very interesting. And it's, that, it's taking the science bit of science fiction and looking how evolution can work with different environments. So I'm, I'm going to stay on you, Chris, and ask, so since you like aliens, how do you create an engaging alien uh, within an RPG? Um, I think you always have to, with the, if you're creating any sort of creature, you always have to ask what its function is in the game. Um, because whether it's you want, um, you know, just cannon fodder type things, or you want some really big nasty boss monster, or you want a whole intelligence race, you, you, you have a function for them. And you need to design for that function. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, the aliens are just effectively races and fantasy games. So you, to engage it, you think, well, I need an alien who has lots and lots of higher technology than us, and you build an alien which does that and look at the implications of that. So, you know, if they have you know, faster than light travel, what are they going to be doing? And make them interesting because you add depth to the aliens. You're not just a, you know, a human with pointy ears or whatever. Philomena, what's some tips for creating an alien uh, or an alien race or species? You know, it's not technically a race, but a species in an, in an RPG. Well, it depends on who's signing your paycheck. Um, so if you want it to be a, a threat, um, I, I do like to create something that is so dramatically outside of understanding. Um, and that's, that's where you can kind of creep into, like, the um, outsider horror of, like, you know, your Lovecrafts and your Pandorums and your Event Horizons, where basically whatever it is is a thing that we can't comprehend, so we just have to deal with surviving. Um, um, but if you're going to do something that's, like, socially engaged and people are going to in interact with, um, basically any shortcut that you wouldn't take when presenting a real-world culture you don't want to take with aliens either. Like, I hate blanket statements of, well, this entire race is blank. Um, you wouldn't want to do that about people living in the Sahara. You wouldn't want to do it about people on another planet. Um, unless you're really doing, like, a 316 style, you're just going and blowing up as many bugs as possible, um, which can be fun, but I don't know if it's really, really examining science fiction. At that point, it's not really science fiction. It's just um, hack and slash with bugs and laser guns. Uh, Jared, do you have any? If you were paid, could you make an alien RPG? How would you make an alien an RPG? Um, I started to, then I got bored by it. <laughs> the people were more exciting than the aliens, so I was like, yeah, I'll just do that in some, some other game. It, and I'm just curious, in, in Free Market, <clears throat> there was no, like, cat people transmutation type nope. of science. Nope. Was that a, a conscious choice on, on your part then? Yeah. We, uh, we, we, didn't, we, didn't want aliens. we didn't want aliens. We didn't want uh, robots with human brains. We didn't want... Um, uh, you know, replicants, synthoids. We, we were going to, and Luke said, write it. <laughs> Luke told me, write a story 
um, about uh, about why it's a bad idea. Why, why write me a story about why you can't have robot player characters in free market? And I did, and he's like, okay, we can't use this because the robot's more sympathetic than the people, and people are going to want to play this character. So uh, I don't think I think I might have posted on my blog years ago, but uh, we nixed that idea. Um, but yeah, in free market, if you're a cat person, you're a person with cat ears and a tail. You're not an actual cat person. You're not a genetically uh, you're cat-like, but you're not. You don't have cat DNA or anything. It's not like Blue Planet, where they have the Silvas and the cats and all the the crazy animal hybrids. Right, or or like in um, uh, or Eclipse oh, Games. Thank you, where they have the uplifted. Thank you. Yeah. Which is cool, but it's not what we want to do. Um, we want to do stuff that we everything in free market you can do. We can do now in some form, and we just kind of take it to the an extreme. Uh, but we don't want any. We don't want any fantastic sci-fi like. Uh, faster than light travel or teleportation or uplifted animals. Understood. All right, Ryan, I, I come to you last again, but it's because I, I pick on you because I like you. Well, first of all, uh, I would start with your face, Rich. <laughs> um, no, uh, so, I mean, there's just been some talk about using them as, like, the threat of the outsider or whatnot. Um, I'll go a totally different route. I mean, if you're looking for something that's more of a romp than something that is serious, then you want to go with car with caricatures. Uh, the reason that uh, I was excited to work on Bulldogs uh, when I did um, was that there was on, on the surface there were these silly little caricatures, um, with, with a couple exceptions where the um, like the little teddy bear race were basically the most foul mouth uh, prostitute laden. Um, motherfuckers in the galaxy, um, and I, I, I forget. Can I swear I've, I've forgotten? <laughs> well, you have uh, twice, so evidently you're capable. Yes, still got it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just uh, you know, make some caricatures because people are going to pick this up at a con game and they'll laugh or whatever. And then, uh, but then put the ability for them to because then that's a platform, sort of in the improv sense give them the, the ability to tilt afterward. We're like, all right, well, I'm this race, and there are these sort of, like, more or less stereotypes about my people, uh, I will tilt it, which is also known as the dritz Dorden effect of, well, every, every draw is evil, so every player draw is totally the iconic, you know, the iconic class, not evil character. So you're, you're saying that your, um, your teddy bear characters had... Twin scimitars and well, doesn't panther. every teddy bear character have twin twin scimitars? Indeed. All right, Ryan, I'm going to stay on you. What does um, what does a science fiction gloss add, and what does it complicate or make worse in a game? What do you mean by gloss? Like just a thin veneer of science fiction on something, or taking a game? You know how we talked about the fantasy race is is an elf, and science fiction is an alien. When you kind of cast it in that mold of a futuristic science fiction setting RPG, what does that what does that add to a game's design? Or if if that doesn't feel comfortable for you, what does a complicator make worse? What what makes it hard? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to you... talk I'm going to talk about that second bit. I talked about it on my blog like a month ago. Um, so if you're making a race or you're making a tech or you're making something and it's totally this sort of weird sense of invention because pretty much almost every science fiction that you get these days is someone's actual IP, especially the popular stuff. So you can't say, you know, you, you cannot say my dudes are Vulcans unless it's your home game. You know, you have to sort of talk around that or whatever. You don't have the touchstones you can draw on the same way you, you can on fantasy. Like, I got an elf. We call it an elf. Granted, these elves are enslaved by humans, you know, a la Dragon Age. You know, they could actually use the word elf. They could use the, the, the physical characteristics of elf, but no one can say, my, my, my thing's got Vulcans and Klingons and also Yoda. Um, so it adds the fact that you can't actually grab on touchstones. So you have to over-explain and hope people get it, and you have to get a lot more investment in in order to just see, yeah, um, uh, okay, I think I understand what's going on here. I mean, basically, it makes everything kind of a mess uh, until people understand it, and by then, they've got a lot of investment. So people who are just playing it for the first time, you're like, 
what's this? I had that sort of issue with playing Ash and Stars, where it's an investigative game, uh, but because I had really little idea of the setting because it was setting rich enough, I'm like, I don't know what I'm investigating. I have to be constantly told the world in order to know what's weird about the situ it's, uh, situation. It's interesting. Um, Jared. Yes. What does, uh, what is the science, same question, yes, yeah, science fiction gloss or, or the, the science fiction add on to uh, an RPG, what does that, what does that complicate, what's it make worse, what does it add to the design? Well, most science fiction RPGs aren't. They're just fantasy games set in space or, you know, in the back of your, back of a truck going the highway. Um, if you look at a game like Talislana, one of my favorites from, from way back, it's a fantasy game. If you squint, it's post-apocalyptic science fiction. Uh, and both of those are in quotes because it's basically just a bunch of really weird-looking people wandering around this blasted wasteland of a, of a kingdom that, that, that uh, suffered a really bad disaster. Um, most games kind of uh, in, in, in that game you, one, one of the big things is you meet other races and you talk to them and deal with them and there's a lot of trading and stuff and how that's different from like Traveler or Star Frontiers uh, I don't see a huge difference so I don't consider any of those really science fiction games because they're not dealing with science fiction elements um, they're dealing with laser guns and spaceships and aliens but they're you know it might as well be uh, magic swords magic bows and, and you know, works. Um, it's just an excuse to go on adventures. It's adventure role playing. It's not science fiction role playing. The whole fantasy science fiction uh, genre that gets affixed to stuff is kind of bogus. It's most of it's adventure or superhero role playing. Would you say that about most RPGs in general? Yeah, totally. They're almost all of them are. Even Call of Cthulhu is an adventure RPG. Um, but that's another topic for another panel. Yeah, one that I won't moderate. <laughs> uh, so, Philomena, I want to get a little bit more specific to talk about Flatpak. Did you have any specific... Uh, when you made this decision to... Okay, let me step back, as sure. I am want to put the cart before the horse. Tell us a little bit about Flatpak for those people who, who aren't happy enough to have it in their hands. Right. So, first of all, um, depending on definition, Flatpak is probably not a science fiction game. Um, probably, but it is about the future, so I didn't feel too bad being here. Um, the, the shortest, and like people will argue for days about what the definition of science fiction is and sci-fi and sci-fi and sci-fi. Um, the, the shortest definition that I've ever heard that I liked was, um, that whatever it is, if you remove the science from the story when asking your what if, um, then everything falls apart. That like it, it can't exist without this bit of science. So to take um, um, Jared's game, um, free market, right? Um, without the existence of the self-replicating, um, oh crap, the the replicators, right? And the fact that people can make anything from basically nothing. Right. Um, if you remove that aspect, a lot of the rest of the game kind of falls apart. Um, it, as a cohesive whole. The parts of the games on their own will still totally work, but as a cohesive whole, to play that game specifically, you need that science fiction detail. Um, if you ask me, and I'm not an expert, but that's what I would say. So, the closest you can get with Flatpak is, Flatpak is, the end of the world happens, post-apocalyptic, um, blows up, I never define what happens, that's up to the table. Um, and you are the grandchildren of the grandchildren of the people who lived before the apocalypse. Everybody went underground, kind of fallout kind of style, um, and they spent a couple of generations down there, and then all of a sudden they found these, these manuals um, to guide them to living on the surface again. Now the manuals are bits and pieces of like corporate um, propaganda and um, self-help books. Um, they're basically cobbled together anything that they found lying around. So there's a lot of like very goofy um, marketing buzzword SEO rock star bullshit that they take as religion, um, quasi-religion. And basically what it says is take a bunch of your kids, send them out onto the surface, um, 
and and have them go recreate civilization. Um, the science, and it's really loosely to, to determine as science of the game, is that there are these buildings that are flat pack buildings, like like you would get IKEA furniture. And if you find them and you bring them back to wherever you want, you can they will open up and basically have all of the parts you need to build a hospital or a church or a synagogue or or a you know whatever. And within them are like hollow tape things that you watch for 20 minutes and then suddenly now you're a fully licensed doctor. Um, so it's it's very goofy. It's very it's you know for a younger audience um, or a drunk audience. Very good with a drunk audience. <laughs> um, and um, the, really, the important thing is the the social interaction and the the civilization building, um, which I guess is a soft sci-fi, um, which is how I still kind of call it call it sci-fi. Um, and that's like I guess I almost want to call post-apocalyptia its own genre separate from science fiction, um, because it almost always goes back into more of a sword-swinging, um, you know, Conan the Barbarian thing. Um, almost, it's, it's almost more that than it is a science fiction, but it still feels like the future to me, because, well, we didn't vote for Romney, but, you know, whatever. I talked a really long time. You can talk, stop me at any point. <laughs> no, thank you, and, and I appreciate the 401. <coughs> I appreciate the info on, on Flatpak, just so we kind of have that, that scope. When you decided to make Flatpak, were there any particular challenges, or, or was the science fiction, I understand what you're saying, it's kind of loose or soft sci-fi. You had the Flatpak. Uh, adding that science element, were there any particulars about that design that that was a challenge? Like, how sciencey did you have to get when you created these these Flatpak designs? Yeah, I mean, how, how nuts and bolts did you have to get? Well, so Flatpak is totally hand wavy. Um, it's absolutely a we make it up at the table and it works because it needs to work for the story. Um, when we did, when my husband and I did uh, Machine Zeit, which is our um, up in the space stations, um, he did all the research on um, uh, elevators, sky elevators, whatever they're called. Um, and, and what it would be like to have like actual stations floating at the periphery of the planet and of, of the atmosphere. And um, then we did a lot of research into um, the, the replicators and, 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 and energy. It, it was very complicated. Um, and it ended up taking a lot of our time. Um, but it allowed us to drop a lot of um, plot seeds that I don't necessarily have in Flatpak. I don't have a lot of world building in Flatpak. I don't have a lot of um, detail. It's a small book. It's like 50 pages. Um, I don't have a lot of that because I don't have the, the science to draw story out of. Um, so if you're going to do good hard sci-fi or good hard social sci-fi or whatever you're going to do, um, the more research that you can bring into it, the more reality that you can bring to it, like, like the fact that, like, again, the free market, you can do almost everything in the real world now, that makes it ripe and it fills it with um, potential. And when you're doing just a sort of gossy overlay of science fiction, um, you don't have that depth. You don't have that opportunity. Everything's kind of hand wavy, and it's just a sort of generic adventure role-playing game with, with laser guns instead of swords. Um, so that's why I would say do the research, do the hard work. Nice. So I, I think you bring up a really interesting point in your answer, Philomena, that I want to post. And this is from Anna Kreider. So the question she, she posited was, what exactly makes a game science fiction anyway? What makes a sci-fi game? Me again? I don't know. It seems like you have an answer, so I guess so. Yeah, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's the research, it's the crunch, it's the detail, um, it's the... Um, it's the, it's the, if this technology, whatever it may be, is pulled out of the setting, is pulled out of the game, then the game doesn't make sense. Um, so I guess, for example, Traveler, right? If you don't have faster than light travel, is Traveler work? Not really. It'll fall apart. I'm, I mean, I don't know, I don't, I haven't played Traveler in a million years, so I don't remember if they had shooting things. Or, um, like Mass Effect, right? If the, the video game, if you take out the mass relays, it falls apart. 
the whole backstory, the forward story, a lot of the cultural details, none of those things exist if you remove that big chunk of science. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Um, anything to add, Ryan? Uh, well, I got the two answers. The one that totally agrees with Philomena, the one that totally doesn't. Um, so the totally doesn't one is, uh, does it explore humanity? Yes. Then it might be science fiction. No, it doesn't. Um, the other one being that, is it a moment when somebody can fantasize about the future? Uh, then sure, it's science fiction. Um, it depends on what it is that someone's looking for out of their science fiction. Uh, these days, I'm actually looking more for, um, hey, it would be nice to, you know, actually kind of like read somebody intelligently explore humanity and stuff like that. Like, I like some of Scalzi's stuff uh, for that. I really dug uh, Old Man's War. But at the same time, I also like the hell out of Mass Effect. And, you know, because I like shooting aliens, I guess. That's science fiction? Yes, I think so. Jared? I'm pretty severe on my definition. I go by uh, J.G. Ballard's definition, which is uh, one, his critique of, uh, of modern literature, which is it's the only valid form of literature that we have is science fiction, because everything else is just thinly failed autobiographies. And, uh, that a science fiction novel or text or whatever is... Uh, deals with three things. It deals with uh, time, uh, it deals with the nature of identity, it deals with space. Um, that's it. And that's, that's, that's what I go by. If it doesn't deal with those things, then it's not science fiction, it's something else. So what are some games that you enjoy, some RPGs that you enjoy that, that meet those criteria? Uh, I... It's, I, I don't, I'm not here to, to bash or laud games, so I don't really want to answer that question. Oh, not even laud? No, not really. It's, it's not really important what I think is good um, or what I think is science fiction. What about some games that are well-designed? When, when I'm writing, uh, I, that's what I look at. Um, I have games that don't have any technology in them whatsoever, uh, but they're definitely science fiction games. What about game designs? Are there any particular game designs that you think hit uh, and answer those? Uh, are you talking... When you say game design, are you talking an RPG game yeah. design? So yeah, in particular. That, how's that different than the game? <laughs> how's that different than the first question? Are you trying to trick me? Well, yes, and I failed. Uh, darn. I figured if you wouldn't compliment the actual game and you, your enjoyment that you might at least talk about the design yeah, itself. It's all the same. Jared doesn't like anything, and that's perfectly okay. <laughs> you just have to embrace that. I like some things. I just don't want to use this as a, uh, you know, Jared's light corner. Man, I'm never going to establish your cult of personality and continue to do this, Jared. <laughs> it's okay. <sighs> Chris, uh, what makes a, guy, a game science fiction to you? Um, it's got to be science. Um, I mean, the, I think there's an important distinction uh, between science fiction and sci-fi. Sci-fi is uh, laser guns running around, you know, Star Trek and all, all the rest of things where, you know, it could be just fantasy or it could be any other genre. You know, Star Trek was, of course, famously a Western by a, a different disguise. Um, where you have science fiction is, as Philomena was talking about, you, that you have some essential technology and that you explore the logical um, consequences of that and you build the world around that technology. Um, and then that technology could be completely you know, hand wavy, you know, and just called magic by a different name. But the consequences of that technology have to follow logically, have to follow the principles of the science you've established. And that's how you create a, a science-based um, universe or, you know, game setting or whatever you want to call it. And so, yeah, that's that presence of the science. If the science isn't there, it's not science fiction, it's sci-fi. It's an interesting breakdown, sci-fi to science fiction. 
I think there are a lot of, of sub-genres of science fiction. Like, Philomena, you talked about post-apocalyptic and how that may or may not be sci-fi. Um, if and this question comes from Anna Kreider as well, I think it's, it's probably perfectly timed right now as we dovetail off of that. What's the sub-genre of, of science fiction or sci-fi that you're, you are personally excited about? Uh, from space opera to a space western, cyberpunk, post-apocalyptic. Uh, what, what's the subgenre that you really most key into? And then how do you think that that genre can translate into game design? Jared. Um, I like cyberpunk quite a bit. Uh, I think cyberpunk, when you boil it down to it, is just uh, sci-fi games about economics, about economic implications rather than uh, technological implications. Um, in other words, if you're selling something in your, sci in your, in your sci-fi RPG, then it's probably a cyberpunk game. Um, how it translates into game design, I'm not really sure what that question means, but I'll give it a stab. Um, there's lots of bells and whistles. Uh, it's, it's near enough to where we live. In fact, it's probably where we live right now so that it's very easy to make connections between how life is now and how it could be, or how it will be. Uh, so you don't have to explain a lot to players. You can say, hey, you know that thing that you wanted to do yesterday? Well, now you can. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And you're like, well, it's cool, except that now these guys are doing this with it. And then they say, oh, that's not cool. I'm like, yeah, nobody thought of that. But somebody gamed it. Somebody did it, and they took advantage of it. Now they're griefing everybody with it. And you're like, oh, wow, that's, that's, a, you know, that's an adventure. Um, so in that, in that context, it's pretty easy. You just repeat the same stories you've been repeating, but you put in some technological gadget, and uh, either as a MacGuffin or as a, um, a facilitator. For example, any movie pre-1980, you could remake with cell phones and completely change the nature of the movie. Uh, I mean, if uh, for some reason in Star Wars, they don't have you know, the ability to, to send messages back and forth um, easily because if they did, they probably would have solved a lot of problems between star systems. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I said, lots of bells and whistles, lots of um, points of contact. The fact that cyberpunk's about so many things as well as economic theory, essentially. Uh, I mean, economic theory and game theory is pretty much the same. So that's easy to translate. Um, when Mike Pondsmith did the cyberpsychosis uh, stats for, uh, for cyberpunk. He wasn't just balancing, and I just talked about this um, with some people uh, recently, so it's on my brain. He wasn't just putting in kind of a crappy game balancing thing so that somebody doesn't load up on cyberware and become a rampaging monster without any repercussions. He was also kind of making a statement that, and after talking to him, I know this, because before I was just like, this is a crappy game mechanic. This is just so I can't have, you know, full body conversion. He said, no, 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 no. As soon as you start replacing body parts, it doesn't make you less human. It just makes you less able to relate to people who aren't like you, which I relate to every day I get on the subway in New York City. Um, like, you people are not like me. Get out of my way. I have things to do. Why are you walking so slow? Um, why are you looking up all the time? It's just a Tommy Hilfiger store. It's not that interesting. So, um, and that alienates me. So just imagine if I was walking around with a metal body. That would be... Uh, at the same time, awesome and horrible. So that's why I like cyberpunk. Nice. I feel like I just gave my, my class presentation. Why I like cyberpunk <laughs> by Jared, age eight. <laughs> Mrs. Fogg's English class. Thank you, Jared. Head back to your seat. Okay. All right. <laughs> Ryan, can you please come to the front of the class and tell us about uh, your favorite subgenre? <sighs> Uh, so everything Jared said, honestly, is is there. Um, I like near future stuff, and a lot of that ends up being cyberpunk. Um, but I was also transfixed by uh, Steve Jackson Games' Transhuman Space because it was near enough. It had a lot of cyberpunk of the the sort of the economic theory elements to it, and it was about exploring the the various the degrees of being human where. All right, we can we can start replacing a lot of stuff. We can start, you know, screwing with your DNA, uploading a consciousness into a bioroid, things like this. What does it mean to be human? And not necessarily from like an existential point of view, but also from a human rights point of view. Uh, bioroids are basically biological androids that you could 
you know, upload yourself into, had very different rights depending on where you lived. And so the sort of sense of, sort of like, sort of bringing back, like, elements of things, the discussions like slavery and, and things like that from a very new context. Oh, excuse me, uh, from a very new context. And so I like that. And that, of course, gets back to economic theory, but uh, because in a lot of ways, human rights ties into that. They already have uh, problems with cyborg rights right now. They had uh, that guy who had his, uh, his glasses were grafted to his face with little screws, and they, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a mounted camera or something, and they tried to re remove it from him, and... The McDonald's manager, yeah, yeah. he ripped it off of his face. It was awful. Yeah, but it was attached to his face. So can right. you imagine somebody doing that with, like, a cyborg's arm? Right. You just, just watch, like, people panic and freak the fuck out, and that's three for me. Um, uh, and just, like, and, and do that sort of thing, and then just put that onto, like, a global level where, you know, even when people get used to it, you're still going to have people who think, hey... That guy's not good enough to have a human arm. He's not good enough to have an arm. And then the reverse. That guy's yeah. not good enough to have a metal arm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, just yeah, it gets just all of that, all of that identity politics, like you see in the in the game community, taken to eleven. Racism is going to be a lot less of a problem uh, when we're all covered in metal. <laughs> right. Create new problems. Right. Well, I mean, and my metal is not necessarily going to be the same as your metal. Yeah, it's going to be brain identity. It's going to be IBM versus Apple. Right. Or or last year's model versus this year's. Yeah, which never happens. Nope, never. <laughs> Let me go play on my old iPhone now. You use what? A 4? Not a 4S? Uh, I use a 4S now. Oh, not oh. a 5? Yeah. You I'm genetically inferior now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the Galaxy. No, I'm uh, no, 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 that's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. That dude, that was smug too. I have a galaxy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> losers. How, how, how's that feel to have a galaxy, Rich? It doesn't feel good at all. I just did it for a joke. I have a four. Uh, Philomena. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, what's galaxies your are, people write galaxies are jokes, right? Are they are they going to sit in the back of the bus? All the galaxy people have to sit in the last row. No, we don't let them on the bus. With their free <laughs> OS and their, you know... Maxis work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. That was a very lively discussion, fellows. Now let's talk to someone with uh, maybe a more level head on our shoulders. Philomena, tell us, what's your favorite <laughs> subgenre? Um, well, following that, um, so my favorite subgenre of science fiction is feminist science fiction, and that can't be made into a game, or it hasn't been yet. Um, so I'm going to move right past that um, and say that my favorite for a game right now, because my husband keeps building these Gundam models, I really, really need to do a giant robot game. Um, and I don't know if that's really good science fiction. I don't know if it's going to be really well researched or anything, but it's probably going to be a lot of fun and giant robots are cool. Um, so if I can't do the, the feminist science fiction, I'll have to do the giant robots. If you don't do, do feminist do. science fiction, I will, Philomena. What's that? If you don't do the feminist science fiction role playing game, I will. I will. I I'll will. Carry that torch for you. Why don't we we race to it? See who does it first. <laughs> or we could work together because it's all about community building. No, I prefer competitive. Uh... Then, then you're not a very good feminist. Well, Ooh, where am I? Ooh, I threw that out already. We're already there. <laughs> that was oh, fast. <laughs> they turn on their own. Right. <laughs> right. I think, I, I think the solution is. Giant feminist robots. Do you know, it's funny. No, I can't tell you about that because that's not being developed yet. But when it is, there will be. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Chris, tell us, what's your favorite subgenre of sci-fi? Um, I, I think, yeah, we've already mentioned post-apocalypse doesn't really count as science fiction. But yes, it does. Did. For this for this podcast, it does. It's, oh, it's it can. I would say it can. This is definitely, not a if, if this pod, uh, yeah, okay, hang out, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it would definitely be post-apocalyptic. Um, you know, Child of the Cold War. I love it. You know, it, it's just my favourite genre because you can do so much of it. You can get players scrabbling around for completely inconsequential items, um, but you can also throw in the stupid science fiction because you can like choice of what the post what caused the apocalypse. 
clips. Um, you can say, well, if it happened a little bit in the future, and then sort of introduce some new technology. Um, so, you know, post-apocalypse, yeah, it would 100% be my number one choice. Nice. Uh, real quick, is science fiction always, or especially science fiction games, are they always a commentary on the present? Everything's a commentary on the present. Contrarian, Ryan, is there any way it's not? Um, I guess most of the time it's probably a commentary on the present, or at least indirectly so, but sometimes you can have a commentary on the past where you re-theme something from the past in the future, like the Battle of Thermopylae in the future. Kind of like Hellas, perhaps, where it's Greek mythology in the far-flung future. Right, but that still often ends up being because of our own sense of biases. It tends to be, uh, at least indirectly, commentary on the present. Or it will be when somebody else looks at it and says, hey, you made this in the 80s, and I clearly totally am now like a scholar of games in the 80s, and I see this, you know, whatever. For good or at, for good or ill. Uh, Philomena or Chris, any, any thoughts on whether science fiction? Yeah, I, I think it's um, pretty... Um, I, I think, yeah, it's, because you cannot, can't escape that if you're writing something, you are taking in the world around you, and you're always going to do it. And But I, I think it's, not, it's, it's a comment on what we want the future to be at this point in time, and that does change. Um, you know, we, or... You know, the difference between you go through cycles of quite optimistic science fiction to quite depressive science fiction. Um, you know, you, you look at, you know, what the sort of utopian things are, so, you know, in the 60s you've got Star Trek, etc., um, to some quite dystopian things are Blade Runner. You know, you get the, the opposites, but they're both sort of what we're liking, what, what we're anticipating the future to be, and that's a sort of hope basically basically what we hope it to be or what we fear it will be so yeah it's a comment on now but it's a comment on what we want for the future now interesting so you it's a comment on what we want for the future but you like post-apocalyptic so yeah but the thing about the post-apocalyptic I mean you, you see this now with the zombie genre particularly um, and why that's so popular as a sort of a post-apocalypse effectively is because it's that freedom it, it's what post-apocalypse allows you to do is take your normal world and throw away the rules so I can go and get the shotgun I can go and use the pickaxe into people's heads you know I might want to do that every day as you commute or whatever else but you can't but in a, in a post-apocalyptic game suddenly the rules are off and you can do that. So uh, it's hopeful of that sort of freedom. I want, I want my freedom. I want to be able to escape the norms of society. It's very much what the dark disaster type things are, um, the post-apocalypse side of things are. Great. Well, we did get started a little bit late, but we have come up to the time that we had scheduled to end this Hangout. So I will... Uh, Go ahead and let everyone go with a very strong thanks. Thank you, Philomena, Jared, Ryan, Chris. I appreciate all of you joining us uh, on our first Pound Game Night Designing the Future panel. Uh, any parting shots from anyone? Anything that you want to talk about? Philomena, anything that you want to uh, mention as we kind of close up here? Um, my website is hacked, so I can't tell you to go there. I don't think that the post-apocalyptic genre has to be about bad things and preppers and um, removing all of social nicety. And that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jared, anything that you wanted to uh, give us an out shot, sir? I'll be at PAX East in March in Boston. And Ryan, anything from sure. you, sir? Uh, I just released uh, my uh, long-awaited, or not awaited, depending on who you are, game Mythender, um, which you can get at mythenderrpg.com. And I'm afraid of Chris now because he wants to put a pickaxe in my skull. It's not specifically you, it's just most people. Oh, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> but, but there's no rules now. It could be tomorrow. It's, he's, I'm guessing sure. he's a Ron Paul supporter. So I'm going to have to do it to you first. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. Hugs and kisses, Ryan. <laughs> Chris, anything from you as we close out here, sir? 
Uh, yes, do, do, don't forget to check out 66 Bots, which we'll be publishing sometime later this year, where you get to play robots, and it's sort of sci-fi rather than science fiction. Uh, and will be lots of, U- lots of UK cons over the coming weeks and months. Great. One last thing. For those who are watching the live feed, uh, we are about 25 minutes away from the start of Mark Diaz Truman's game uh, that he will be running as another part of Pound Game Night. And I, uh, it's, it's our last best hope that's coming up at 8 p.m. Eastern here on January 19th. If it is not January 19th when you're listening to this, I'm sorry, you missed it. But it should also be on the YouTube channel for Indie Plus, and please check that out. It's an excellent game. Thanks, everyone, for coming on and talking with us. Thank you to the people who submitted questions and for everyone who is checking us out. We hope you enjoyed it, and we would love your feedback. Uh, This is something we want to make as a a monthly event, so hopefully uh, you enjoyed it and would like to see the next in February. So thanks, everybody, and have an excellent evening. Thank you.